everybody, this is Grandmaster Robert Hungaski for ChessLecture.com and today we're going to be talking about the man of the hour, Hans Niemann, who's been giving the chess world a lot to talk about, not just because of his antics and the controversy surrounding his games, but really he's been playing some amazing games. How responsible he is for that amazingness is a matter of debate perhaps, but I think there is no question that we are in the presence of a spectacular player who is in the middle of his rise to the top. So I want to talk about the game. And by the game, I mean the game that he beat Magnus Carlsen with the black pieces, because it was really a great game. It began d4, knight f6, c4, e6, knight c3, bishop b4, g3, and after castle king side, bishop g2, d5, and now a3, bishop takes, pawn takes, and d takes c4. It's always fun to watch Hans's post-game interviews, and of course, this game would become infamous because after this game, Magnus Carlsen would withdraw from the Singfield Cup, all but accusing Neiman of cheating, of using engine assistance during the game. So he didn't quite make that accusation after this game, or even after the next time they played, where Magnus also infamously resigned after one move. But then he did officially present a document saying, you know, what we've all heard. Now, one of the arguments that I believe Carlson was putting forth was that he had never played this position before and Neiman was just rattling out all of his moves. When it was Hans's turn to talk after the game, he said that that really wasn't accurate because Magnus had in fact played not this exact position, but certainly this variation a few years ago against Wesley So, and then Neiman started to pretty much cite the game and the moves. So that was a pretty convincing counter argument. In that game, Wesley So had played c5 and after knight f3, then castle kingside, bishop g2, c takes d4, knight takes d4, d5. C takes, knight takes, and now after queen b3, Carlson actually had two games. One went way back against Kramnik, where Kramnik played the move knight c6, and that game ended up being a draw. And then more recently, of course, against Wesley So in 2019, that went queen a5, and this is the game that Neiman was referencing. And after castles, knight takes c3 and a3, and this is also kind of a well-established theory. So Hans was definitely well prepared for this game and he decided to play a slightly different way. Right? Carlsen certainly had experience against c5 so Hans was going for the d5 ideas which to me are really the most critical whenever you're dealing with Catalan types of structures because when you put a pawn on d5 you're highlighting the main drawback of putting a bishop on g2, which is that the c4 pawn loses its natural defender, which is the bishop on f1. So after bishop g2, d5, a3, takes, takes, of course Neiman takes the pawn on c4 because that's the whole point against the Catalan. You want to take this pawn and either hang on to it and argue I'm just up a pawn, or use it as a bargaining chip to get something else. Now, there is a big downside to this, which is that the bishop on g2 is unleashed, and white can put a lot of pressure along this diagonal. So, Carlson continued with knight f3, and after c5, castles, c takes d4, queen takes d4, knight c6, and queen takes d4. Okay, so, Neiman was still in book, and actually 
in his post-game interview, he rattled off some uh, pretty impressive home preparation. In fact, he played some pretty impressive home preparation in this game, which we'll see in just a moment. But it would seem like White got to have his cake and eat it too, right? White got to put the bishop on g2 and recovered the pawn on c4. So it's all good news. Not exactly. Well, and of course, the bishop on g2 has been completely unleashed, right? The pawn on d5, the Catalan, is usually aimed specifically at restricting the bishop on g2. Black usually adopts a structure like b7, c6, d5, so that that bishop on g2 feels like it's biting on granite. As you start to clear this diagonal of pawns, the bishop on g2 gains in strength. So black has a problem here. Black has yet to develop the queenside bishop, and the queen side is going to be under a lot of pressure. It's already under pressure with the queen. The knight is going to come to d4. The rook is probably going to come to b1. The bishop's probably going to come to f4. The other rook is going to come to d1. Maybe a4, bishop a3 can be an idea. Maybe the queen can come to b5 and also increase the pressure on the b file. So there is a lot of potential for peace activity in white's position, in large part, thanks to white's damaged pawn structure, right? So a damaged pawn structure should not incline you to think that your position is bad. It should incline you to emphasize peace activity over consolidating moves. So here Neiman plays a very important move, plays e5. He's going to solve the problem of the bishop by not fianchettoing it, but rather developing it to e6, f5, or g4, and also, very important, stopping knight d4, so that the bishop on g2 is still slightly restricted by the knight on f3. Magnus plays bishop g5, and after h6, rook fd1. It seems like white is getting there. For example, if black were to play a move like queen e7, after bishop takes f6, queen takes knight d2, then the bishop is finally released. The knight can come to e4 and d6, or e4 and c5. The rook can come to b1. It seems like everything's on track. Maybe I can even think about taking on c6 and messing up your queen side. But here Neiman plays a very important move. He plays bishop e6. And this creates a problem for white because... At first, I thought, well, here, queen b5 looks like a very strong move. And originally, I thought that black's idea was to play queen b6, again, forcing the queen trade. And now, after something like queen takes, pawn takes, I was trying to figure out, well, what's really going on in this endgame? I think black is doing fine. I think we've done a good job at creating pressure against a3. We're probably going to do a good job at creating pressure against c3. The knight can come to a5, and black's weaknesses are really not easy to capitalize on. At least not h6 and f6. Probably b6 is going to be the only reason that white's not worse here. For example, rook db1, white definitely has some counterplay, but I still think after rook a6, rook a8, knight a5, knight c4, if anybody's better here, it's black. But it turns out there's an even stronger move. A more active move, which is queen a5. A more ambitious move rather than more active. Of course, the point is that if you trade everything, I have all the trumps from before with without having to give white pressure on the b file. Now I'm just going to play rook c8, rook c7, rook fc8, b6. Black must be strategically winning here. And if you take on b7, which is really what would have caused me to rule this out, Black has a beautiful move here, rook fc8, winning on the spot. Threatening to take the bishop, but also threatening to trap the queen with rook ab8. And after bishop takes f6, rook ab8, and it's lights out for white. So, I think maybe Magnus missed this move, queen a5, because now he's forced to go into this endgame. And since white was going for peace activity to compensate his worst pawn structure, 
the queen trade is definitely going to be a step in the wrong direction. Now, after everything gets traded off, e2 is under attack, so plays king f1, and now black picks up the d file, and most importantly, it's getting ready to vacate the long diagonal so that this bishop won't really be able to put pressure on anything. So after king e1, knight a5, rook d1, we get another key moment in the game. And here Hans provided some pretty interesting analysis as well. In general, when you're faced with the decision of whether to trade a rook or not, what you have to pay attention to is who has the more accessible pawn weaknesses, right? We both have pawn weaknesses, but blacks are much harder to attack than whites. So the rook is, its true essence is being able to put pressure on weak pawns. That's what the rook loves to do more than anything else. So whenever you feel like your opponent has weaker pawns than you do, then you would want to keep the rooks on the board, right? And especially if you can't really see a forced variation that allows you to win those pawns, your intuition should tell you, ah, I'm going to keep these pieces on. So the natural move is rook c8, which is what Neiman ended up playing. But he pointed out that it was very interesting to take on d1 here because white is basically one hair away from losing his a pawn, which would be devastating because then black would have an outside passer for the end game, which is almost going to have a decisive effect. But the problem is after bishop d5, threatening knight c4, right? If I get to play knight c4, it's over, because then when you go a4, I'm just going to go knight b2, knight takes a4. So, for example, if king c2, then now after knight c4, a4, there's no knight b2. But black can simply go knight b6, and after a5, knight c4. And here, there is a huge problem, right? It seems like you're about to lose your pawn, but white has this beautiful resource, knight d2. And now it's actually white that's winning, because if knight takes d2, bishop takes d5, and the knight is trapped. And if bishop takes g2, knight takes c4, and all of a sudden the knight's coming to d6, and you might be in a sort of good knight against bad bishop situation. Right? The pawn on a5 is untouchable. Not only that, there's another variation that Alejandro Ramirez pointed out in the post-game interview, which both players miss, missed. There's an even better move uh, for white. Instead of king c2, another beautiful defensive resource, which is knight e1. And after bishop takes, knight takes. Knight c4, it seems like you've lost the pawn. And in a knight end game, that outside passer should give black an easily winning position. But white has this brilliant idea, knight e3. And now if knight takes a3, c4, and the knight is trapped. Right? So king c1, king b2 is coming. And if you do something like b5, then after c5, this pawn is running very quickly, so the king has to come over to stop it. And, for example, something like knight f5. You don't have enough time to bring the knight into the game because I'm going to take this outside passer. So you would have to go h5. And now after c6, I'm threatening c7. So you have to go king e8. And after something like c7, king d7, h4, it, it's going to be the other outside passer that does you in. Right, king takes e7, g4 takes an h5, and the game is over. So very interesting uh, position with some serious defensive resources for white. So Neiman decides to sort of stick to the plan and keeps the rooks on the board. And now after knight d2, bishop e6, Carlson sees the writing on the wall and says, okay, let's muddy the waters a little bit because... If, if I don't do anything, I'm going to be dead in the water. Obviously, the idea of c4 is that if knight takes, then you're just trading one very weak pawn for one very healthy pawn. This would be a great trade for white. If b6, just sort of preparing knight takes c4, then white's idea is to plop this bishop on d5 and then sort of consolidate it with e4 
and it looks like white is holding pretty well. But of course, the critical move is the one played in the game. Bishop takes, and after knight takes, rook takes. So black holds on to the extra pawn, and in exchange allows white to activate his pieces with rook d8, and now bishop d5, threatening rook b7, and basically forcing black to drop back with his rook to c7. An interesting point here is that if white were to play rook d7 right away to prevent rook c7 and still threaten bishop d5, black has a very nice sequence here with rook c1 and after king d2, knight b3, and after king e3, then the knight comes back to c5 just in time to kick this rook out and defend b7. Uh, for example, if rook e7, I'm just going to go king f8, and if rook c7, which is the only real attempt at keeping that rook active, then rook c3 wins on the spot, because after king d2, knight e4, and you lose your rook. So you have to retreat with your rook, and then, of course, white's entire idea backfires. So he's got to give this check on d8, and then bring the bishop to d5, allowing rook c7. And now after rook a8, a6, white is going to try to harass black's pawns and dominate the knight on a5, because the white realizes he's worse, right, and that he's got to try to save this game somehow. The way he's going to do it is by going into a rook and pawn endgame where he's going to be down a pawn, but it's very likely going to be a theoretical draw. So that's why the bishop on d5 is so important. If black is able to reincorporate this knight without allowing it to get traded off, then black's going to be at least clearly better, very likely winning. So rook b8, f5, rook e8, e4, and g4. So Carlson is desperately trying to create some counterplay while the knight is isolated from the game. Neiman plays this very nice move, rook c5. If he were to take on g4, then this would give white what he wants. After rook takes e4, for example, f5, now rook f4, and if something like king g6, then e4 and the position's being blown up, and it feels like white might even be better because white's pieces are so much more active. So rook c5 is a key in-between move. It forces the bishop back to a2, and now instead of wasting time again with these complications, which here in fact allow white to go rook e7 and misplace the rook, for example, rook f5, rook takes e4, and now we've got a weird knight, a weird rook. Black is okay, but it's getting it's getting messy. Neiman decides not to wait any longer and to bring that knight into the game. So knight c4. After bishop takes, rook takes, g takes f5, rook a4. This was pointed out to Neiman after the game, saying, well, you know, this, this rook end game is drawn, and he was basically laughing at it. He's like, of course, this is not drawn, this is winning. I'm going to take on a3 and have these two connected pass pawns. Why wouldn't I win? Stockfish seems to think that there are chances to draw for white, but I would happen to agree with Neiman. And another game that I'm going to be discussing in a future video is the one that he won in the U.S. Championship against Sam Sevian. Another brilliant rook and pawn end game. Maybe not brilliant from a theoretical point of view, but from a practical point of view. I mean, he creates so many problems for his opponents that it it ends up being incredibly difficult to defend. So I think this would have been a very tough endgame to defend as white, and that's why Magnus didn't go into it. And Magnus is a pretty good endgame player. So if he thought that this was, you know, a straightforward draw, then he would have taken on c4 in a heartbeat. So he played a4. And now after knight d6, this knight's going to play a fundamental role in the position. It's going to hold black's position together. It's defending f7, b7, e4, and f5. The only problem is that it's not particularly stable because it's not anchored by a pawn. So 
White played rook d7. He could have played rook d8, and this is going to lead to a very similar situation as in the game. So let's just see what happened in the game, and then you can kind of extrapolate it, but I don't want to spoil the, the idea. Now, after f takes g4, rook d7, it seems like the situation of the knight is collapsing because if rook c6, bishop d5, rook b6, a5, maybe you can give a spike check here, but now your knight's going to have to move and you're going to lose all your pawns. And you have to be careful. If white ends up taking on b7 and a6, this outside passer is going to be a real problem. But Neiman had an ace up his sleeve and he played this brilliant move, e3. If you take on d6, I'm going to give a check. I'm going to trade the rooks, and then I'm going to play e takes f2 and promote the pawn. So that's the essence of the trap. And if you go f takes e3, which is what happened in the game, now I'm going to put the knight on e4. And I'm threatening rook c1, rook takes d1, knight c3, and then I'll pick up the bishop on a2. For example, if you play rook takes f7, which seems like the most natural move, you don't have enough time to come back and cover the check because you drop the bishop. So Carlson plays king f1 and evacuates the king. And now after rook c1, king g2, rook c2. The bishop hangs as does the e2 pawn. So Carlson takes on f7, and after rook takes e2, king g1, now king f6, and the king is getting activated. And after bishop d5, this was probably the last key moment of the game. By the way, here, if, if rook takes b7, I think the main point is to go knight g5, and all of a sudden, the white king is feeling a little bit under the gun, right? Knight f3 is coming, and if you go bishop d5, knight h3, king f1, check here, and rook takes h2. Now I've got the two connected passers on the other side of the board. And I don't know, if here, here, takes. This might be the best chance that white has, because you should never underestimate the power of an outside passer and a bishop. But black should be winning. Maybe here I shouldn't have given this additional check. Maybe after something like this, it's better to have the king on f1. Right here. Because now I can give this check and get my rook out of the way for free and push my g pawn, right? And I think I'm, I'm just winning this bishop outright. Okay, yeah, so it's probably still lost. So he decides to anticipate the danger on the king side with bishop d5 in order to meet knight g5 with bishop g2 and keep the knight under control. So Neiman again comes up with a fantastic move, plays rook d2, and after rook d2, white is completely paralyzed. You can't take on b7 with the bishop, you can't take on b7 with the rook, you can't retreat the bishop to g2. Knight g5 is coming, king e5 is coming, and now the game is completely over. So it went rook f7, king g6, rook back to d7, and now black continues with the main point, which is knight g5, right? There's no bishop g2, I'm threatening some devastating checks, and against this discovery, I can go king f5. It's actually what happened in the game. And the rooks get traded off. And we arrive at this bishop against knight endgame where black is up a pawn. And the only hope for white is to really fix these pawns on the queen side and start attacking them as soon as possible. So after a5... White is threatening bishop d5, so black plays king e5. And after king g3, it seems like white might have enough counterplay on the king side. But Neiman again finds 
a move that doesn't let white unleash his idea for counterplay. Now, if you take on g4, I'm going to take away your h2 pawn, right? Your, your last hope of an outside passer. And then I'm going to come after your e3 pawn. For example, if king h5, knight f1, king h6, let's say knight e3, and if king g7, it's going to be a long route until you get to b7. So I'm probably just going to be able to take your a5 pawn first. And okay, that's just hopeless. So Magnus decided to play a very sad move here. Uh, went back to f2. And now after knight takes h2, he goes for this Hail Mary pass idea. Plays e4. So he's speculating with the knight on h2 being out of play. Now white is threatening bishop d5. And after king takes e4, bishop e6, there's no stopping bishop c8, bishop takes b7. And maybe, just maybe, white will get the outside passer that he's been dreaming of. So Neiman plays king f4, and after bishop c8, knight f3, bishop takes b7, knight e5, bishop takes a6, and knight c6, and that's the killer move. Right? The knight rallies back to the queen side just in time to get rid of the a pawn, and the game just won't went a couple more moves. After bishop b7, knight a5, bishop d5. Neiman plays h5. Very important here. If you come after this bishop right away, then you let the win slip away. After king g3 takes, takes, white gets a draw. So there's no rush in chasing away that bishop. We can do that anytime we want. So after h5, bishop f7, h4, bishop d5, now king e5. The king is kept at bay. The knight's going to get reincorporated on the next move. So white decided enough was enough and resigned. So a brilliant game by Neiman. We'll see. <laughs> but in any case, Magnus after the game said, there's only like one or two players in the world that can beat me like this. And Hans Neiman is not one of them. I don't know. I don't know about that. Hans Niemann is really becoming a force to be reckoned with. So we'll see what happens. He certainly seems to be holding up the level of his play at the US Championship. He was off to a bad start. But in the next video, we'll look at some of his games from this epic comeback. He's currently in a tie for fourth place. He was, I think, second to last a few rounds ago. So Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video. This has been Grandmaster Robert Hungaski for ChessLecture.com.